This is a bit of a long video. So before we begin, I want to go through some of what this video covers, so hopefully you'll see why I don't want to just rush through things. Kindly Beast, firing 50 employees before the holiday season without notice, firing someone during a global pandemic without notice, mismarketing, blatant lying, stealing ideas from their fans without credit or consent, nepotism, workplace abuse, and not making a polished product because they believe their fans won't care. Yeah, that's quite a bit. And some of these allegations are complicated, so I've done my best to contextualize them along the way. It's been nearly a whole year since the main point of this controversy occurred, but now I've hopefully compiled it all in a way that's easy to follow. So, with that being said, hopefully this all makes sense. As someone who loves video games, I've been keen to keep an eye on those who make games that I love. I lean more towards independent developers for their transparency above all else. From the big announcements to the screenshots of their next project, it's both fascinating and inspiring. One of the first of these developers was The Meatly Games, now known as Kindly Beast. From that first week that Benny and Link Machine Chapter 1 was released, I was excited to see what they would do moving forward. Now look at my channel, Bendy Video after Bendy Video. It's a game that I love and I hope to do it justice with a series to wrap it all up with. I say this because this video isn't easy to make, and I think you know why. The events in the last year have been difficult to follow both as a fan and in general. Information spans multiple platforms and has been deleted, taken out of context, or even outright fabricated. I've done my best to compile all of it here to help everyone have a complete understanding of the situation and to answer one simple question. Should I support Kindly Beast? Well, this is the story of a company that began to have the story they told reflect their reality. A story full of accusations, aliases, lies, and most exciting of all, potential violations of Canadian labor laws. The story of not only the games, but also their company and its directors. This is a comprehensive look at the lies, the allegations, and the facts as we know them, as well as my own conjecture. This is the story of Kindly Beast. So, what happened? Well, for those who don't know, Kindly Beast, originally named The Meatly Games, was a company founded by Mike Mood and The Meatly. They made a game called Benny and the Ink Machine, which became a viral hit thanks to social media sites such as YouTube and Twitter. They released each chapter of their game every few months, and the controversy began with the release of the final chapter on October 26, 2018. While a large amount of the community was split on the gameplay and the story, one issue became abundantly clear. It had um... bugs. Broken save files, broken AI, quit the title, why not just crash it, start the game, why not just crash it, disappearing enemies, broken AI again, eternal loading, dying from a two foot fall, ridiculous hitboxes, broken AI again, falling out of the map, falling in the wrong spot, Alice is here for some reason, being frozen in place, unable to do anything but force quit the game, and machinery you can walk right through. The console ports are even worse. Flashing curtains, same broken save files, same ghost machines, the AI is somehow even worse than on PC, and they don't even exist the whole time. Viewing distance is too short, enemy sound effects are too loud. This hallway is meant to be dark, and sometimes the chapter 3 elevator stops working, as well as the doors, meaning at any point you can fall in and softlock your game. Now, Mike Mood knew that these problems existed and addressed them publicly six months later. He claimed that they hadn't addressed these issues on PC due to the team being busy working on mobile and console ports, as well as developing Bendy 2 and their new game, Showdown Bandit. At this point, Kindly Beast was now a studio of 40 people, which likely includes staff at Carmen Interactive, Mike's former place of employment, which was purchased by Kindly Beast back in February of 2019. Apparently, all of these employees are working on other projects, and they just can't spare the resources. However, mobile only saw two more updates in the App Store, both in April of 2019, and consoles never saw another update after February of 2019, a few months prior to Mike making this statement. Kindly Beast wasn't even taking care of the console ports to begin with. They were being taken care of by Rooster Teeth Games. Showdown Bandit also didn't release until September of 2019, and Bendy 2, now known as Bendy in the Dark Revival, is slated to release in 2020. This upset fans because this meant that Mike, and to an extent Kindly Beast, had made a broken game, knew that they had made a broken game, and had no plans of fixing it. Surprisingly, nobody wants to play a broken game, and people generally expected the team to fix it rather than just abandon it. 
And this wasn't an unrealistic expectation, as Kindly Beast had released bug fixes after the release of every other chapter. But instead for this to be how Kindly Beast treats their flagship title, some of the more skeptical fans became worried that this would be how Kindly Beast intended to treat all of their games moving forward, and some were simply upset that they paid for a game that is now unplayable at times. Some people were also upset because the winners of the Chapter 5 fan art contest would not have their art featured in the game due to the contest occurring too close to release. Though some find that the fan art never being included at any point afterwards was indicative of a lazy attitude towards the winners. Then in May, the Bendy Twitter account announced another fan art contest, which was labeled the Fan Built Contest, where the winner will have their designs put on merchandise and the grand prize winner will receive a giant Bendy plushie. They also sold the winning fan art from the Chapter 5 fan art contest on shirts, but it would seem that no part of the sales were ever given to the winners as they had waived their rights to the artwork by submitting it in the contest. However, every winner of the fan built contest would receive $2 for every shirt sold, as well as a giant plushie for the grand prize winner. A few months pass, and the Kindly Bee staff continues to grow. The team is now comprised of around 60 people by May, and apparently nearing around 85 employees total. They're expanding the offices and getting a really nice coffee machine. Then the trailer for Showdown Bandit releases, and it all looks very promising. And then, the game is delayed. Quote, we want it to be the best it can be when it reaches our players and fans. End quote. This gave some of the more skeptical players hope since, well, you know the saying. Three weeks later, Showdown Bandit is finally released in September of 2019 with underwhelming success. For a new game made by a team of nearly 85 people to not even break the monthly reviews of Bendy in the same month is, well, underwhelming. But the sales may have been even worse than what the reviews imply. Given that Mike said giving Chapter 5 away for free was like $1.5 million that we're essentially giving away, then it's safe to assume that Bendy had sold roughly 300,000 copies, and that's just for PC, several months before the full game was released, and may or may not include the estimated 30% of revenue that Valve takes from games purchased on Steam. While Bendy may have around 300,000 PC players, at best Shonen Bandit has an estimated 20,000. This could be for a number of reasons. It could be due to the price, since Chapter 1 of Bendy was free in comparison, a lack of bigger name Let's Players exposing the game to a larger audience, or it could simply just not be the lightning in a bottle that Bendy was. Still, they announced some bug fixes and slowly pushed them out over the next few days. They even promised some free DLC down the line, though all they really show is just a title. Regardless, the damage was done and nobody really knew what would happen next. This was going to affect the company though, right? I mean, Bendy merchandise is everywhere, but if the game doesn't sell or isn't relevant anymore, then why would the merchandise? Either way, this was going to be a situation that the Meatly and Mike mood probably didn't foresee themselves in and would have to course correct in order to ensure the studio could stay afloat. But this wasn't going to be about the games or the merchandise or advertising of the games, this was going to be about the people who helped make those games. October 11th, 2019. Kindly Beast employees I follow are all now looking for work, and certain sources say that an Ottawa studio has fired nearly 50 employees without notice. The list of employees on the Kindly Beast website has also been removed altogether. It only took a few moments for people to put two and two together. A post was made on the gaming subreddit and quickly began to spread. Then came the employee reviews on Glassdoor, with anonymous sources making claims of harassment, lies, and detailing Showdown Bandit's troubled development. One specific thing mentioned was that three VPs from Carmen Interactive were fired about a month before Showdown Bandit's release and weren't able to do their jobs because the higher-ups were trying to micromanage at the same time. Being the internet, not everything an anonymous source says will be true. In fact, I can review Kindly Beast myself and make wild accusations if I want to, because Glassdoor requires no verification. However, some of these accusations have been corroborated by those in the Ottawa area, as well as Mike Wood himself, which we'll get to later. These reviews painted a very poor picture of the company, and Mike particularly, as some of the reviews detailed everything from mismanagement and lies to verbal abuse and threats. Naturally, the internet began to ask questions. The Glassdoor reviews mentioned how good the coffee was as one of the only perks, and so that began to be a bit of a meme. The Meatly didn't say a word, and still hasn't to this day, but Mike thought that now would be a good time to share some Thanksgiving photos on Instagram. Everything seemed fine on his end, and yet a few days later he deleted his YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Mike didn't just private these accounts, but deleted them, with every one of his tweets, posts, and videos. Privating content and accounts or just going offline is one thing, but this was years worth of content that was just… gone. Well, except for Mike's SoundCloud, which didn't really have much to begin with. You're so interesting, so different. I have to say, I'm an instant fan. Consider yourself approved. And of course, I also saved a picture of the coffee machine as well. Glorious, isn't it? 
Mike did make a statement in a GamesIndustry.biz article, but it doesn't address these accusations, and some detractors were eager to point out that this was also not exactly an apology, especially when Mike doesn't just outright apologize, and instead says that he is, quote, saddened by the unfortunate position. At this point, the only people who said anything were Matt Gulls and Pastel Claro, who simply denied the claims without citing anything specific. Matt said that Kindly Beast was the best job he's had, and Pascal said it's not anyone's place to know the situation. Around the same time, one of the winners of the Fan Built Contest, who had won the giant Bendy plushie, had to pay roughly $100 to have the plushie shipped to their home in France. Fortunately, they found out a few days later that their money had been refunded. Then in December came the holiday giveaway. The Bendy store was giving away more giant plushies, and to enter, fans could sign up for a newsletter for one entry, and then spend certain amounts of money on merchandise for even more. People were quick to point out that spending money for a random chance to win something is gambling, and given that the Bendy store has no age restrictions and has someone who seems to be the age of a child in the photo for the giveaway, that it would seem like it was promoting child gambling, which is illegal. The issue is that, because you are buying a product for a chance to win something in addition to it, then it is not technically gambling. It also turned out to have been organized by Epic Drops and not Kindly Beast directly. However, this still upset those who had begun to drift further from Kindly Beast, as this showed a lack of insight and control over those whom they trusted with the IP. Weeks passed, and still nobody said a word on the firings. Then, Matt Goals gives everyone an update, thanking fans for sticking by them, and that they're working hard to make Benny and the Dark Revival the game their fans deserve. He also says Mike has been working hard on the project as well, and mentions that there's been some misinformation going around about him. I had responded by saying that they should address these claims, since their fans otherwise have to choose between giving money to a company with that potential history, or their fans turning their backs on them because they're being lied to. It was a long shot, but oddly enough, it worked. Matt responded, giving his perspective on these details, and said that Mike never harassed anyone, and that he didn't want to respond to this situation because of the hate. Matt also explained that a lot hadn't been said by the team due to legal reasons and corporate lawyers. Quote, I can't say a lot here, but I've been with this company for three years, and I can say Mike never abused anyone. He did his job as CEO, he gave everyone proper severance, never did anything illegal, and because of legalities, he's silent. Now the harassment just made him never want to tell his side. It'll just be picked apart and twisted anyway, so what's the point? The people who want to hate us will just believe what they want to believe, and we just have to live with that. What I saw was criticism and feedback. It was never malicious, but a lot of those employees never worked on a game like Bendy before, so we did have more experience than them as to how things should work. A lot of my own feedback went to ignore because some people decided they knew better than I did, even though I was a key programmer on Bendy. From my perspective, a lot of the problems were a breakdown in communication, but it was never malicious." End quote. Initially, I was completely taken aback and ready to believe Matt. This was the transparency I was hoping for, and he responded to me directly. However, Mark, I'm sorry I'm going to mispronounce your last name, Pintar, an ex-senior software developer, jumped into the thread to contradict this, saying that Matt wasn't there for every conversation Mike had with every employee, and that Matt shouldn't blame the new staff for the troubled development. Quote, Yeah, but then there were the other parts of the team who have worked on something similar to Bendy, or they brought other experience to the table. Don't you dare try to start dragging people's names through the mud. A lot of decisions were made based on the lessons learned from Bendy. We were all working as a team. We were aware of potential issues going forward that we saw from the previous code base. Then with the experience everyone had, Bendy or not, there were architectural decisions made to try and mitigate similar issues." End quote. But Mark wasn't the only one to call out Matt here. I am really going to mispronounce his name and I'm really sorry. Kazia Adamo is a developer working at Studio MDHR and helped develop Cuphead. She said that it's not his place to speak on behalf of others. Then finally, James Kelsey Mott, former Carmen Interactive and Kenley B senior developer who was also fired in October, had this to say. Quote, 1. You worked remotely and don't know what working in the office was like, besides what you've been told. 2. Mood chose the path he's on. I don't think he needs anyone's pity or applause for killing himself to make a game. End quote. All three of these replies also garnered likes from ex-Kenley Beast employees. And then, three days later, Mike finally returns to Twitter. He announced a Reddit AMA on December 16th. Quote, zero censorship, no deleting, no bans, open conversation, all are welcome, all questions are welcome. End quote. So, how did it go? Well, in terms of PR, it would seem like a pretty solid victory for both Mike and Kindly Beast. People wanted to know what happened, Mike gave details in his retelling of events, and they moved on. He even gave a far better apology to ex-employees. For now, let's look at Mike's response regarding Bendy's console port. When asked about it, Mike said that Rooster Teeth has the source code, hasn't been paying them, and owes Kindly Beast an insane amount of money. Considering that the head of games publishing at Rooster Teeth also voices Joey Drew, I'd be curious to see if and how they would replace him in the future. Mike also repeats the question, likely to make sure that his response isn't taken out of context. 
Between both the holiday giveaway and Rooster Teeth's silence towards both Kindly Beast and the console port, a few in the fan game community saw this lack of control in both the instance of this and Epic Drops as perplexing. Given that Kindly Beast has been adamant on removing content such as free fan games in order to ensure control over the copyright of their IP and its characters. Mike would also explain later on that Rooster Teeth owns the rights to the console ports, and since Rooster Teeth has the source code and a disbanded gaming division, then all Kindly Beast can do is wait till their contract expires. This, however, did not excuse Kindly Beast from updating the Steam version of Bendy since 2018, leaving the majority of detractors to believe that once their contract expires, there will be no improvements made to the console ports, as enough time will have passed to where Kindly Beast will have no interest in fixing the ports. Though the situation is certainly complicated looking in, as Rooster Teeth Games is now Rooster Teeth Gaming Community as of November of 2019, and while their social media accounts now act as a means of advertising their gaming nights, the website for Rooster Teeth Games hasn't received any news since July of 2019, and someone mentioned that when they emailed Rooster Teeth, they said that they will no longer be able to support the console ports of Bendy. Though this still leaves the questions as to why the last update was seen in February of 2019, as the department didn't officially disband until November. But, uh, this means Ruby Glen Eclipse, and Vicious Circle, and Bendy, and Ruby are gonna be uh, unsupported in a content way going forward. And when I said Ruby, I meant Ruby Deck Builder. Yes. Um, we will address bugs and fixes, and we will keep the servers up, but we won't be pumping out new content uh, for those games, unfortunately. And where all of the money from the console ports is gone since Rooster Teeth Games is now disbanded, and Mike claims that Rooster Teeth owes Kindly Beast a substantial amount of money. Finally, Mike began to respond to people on Twitter again and took up an attitude that I can only describe as haters gonna hate. This was also reflected in his Reddit AMA a little as well. And then Mike deletes all of his tweets again. And that's pretty much the timeline. But then what about the Reddit AMA? What about the accusations? Well, from here, things become more complicated, and so I think it's important to go through the following information by cross-referencing in order to paint out a bigger picture. First, I want to go through the sources of these details and the credibility of the sources used in this video. Coming from anonymous sources means that anyone can say anything, but if these things happen to be agreed upon by a third party who is in the same area and industry as Kindly Beast, or even from Mike Mood himself, then we can alleviate the need for identity when other names are willing to back the source. The AMA is obviously credible as far as Mike goes, though Mike may not have been entirely honest, and there are some individuals which we'll need to address as they come up, but I want to address a few now. First, a user called XKindlyBeast. They made their account on Halloween of 2019, about three weeks after the firings, and made a post on the Bendy Link Machine subreddit the same day. Quote, I've seen a number of bad reviews about Showdown Bandit, and I just want to make one thing clear. At the beginning of August, Mike immediately decided to take over development of the game. They scrapped all the code we had written and the levels we had created. They spent the next few weeks working radio silent, not showing up at the office, not communicating with anyone, not even handing off builds to QA. If you play the game and want to leave a bad review, just know that the dev team in the credits wasn't actually part of the final release. The same thing was happening to Benny and the Dark Revival before the layoff." End quote. When asked for proof, they said they will provide it if they can ensure it won't reveal their true identity. About 10 minutes later, they provide a Slack screenshot of an announcement set out by Mike on August 16th, saying that he, and what is likely the name Paul, aka the Meatly, are taking over the project. X Kindly Beast goes on to claim that the full game was going to be more complex, with around 90 rooms, a ghost world which contained your abilities, more complex options, and a zone that would depict the aftermath of a Romeo and Juliet story. The game the Meatly and Mike created in those three weeks was obviously much different. This included, quote, besides the drastic shifts in tone, story, and design, there were some mechanics that got cut. A lot of other content, including easter eggs, gameplay elements, and cutscenes also got cut. They used the assets we made, 3D models, music, and sound effects, a few cutscenes and props, and mashed the game together." End quote. Then comes the AMA, and they have questions. They're not exactly hostile or toxic, and they even tell other people in the thread to calm down. Initially, they say that they're not representing the views of any employee, but then go on to complain about the conditions at Kindly Beast as if they are an ex-employee. This may be a contradiction, or they meant that they are not representing any one particular employee, potentially implying that the account is run by several ex-employees. Now, I could easily make an account, create a complicated lie using the claims of others as proof that they're legitimate, in order to money the name of Kindly Beast even more, and even Photoshop that screenshot in a matter of minutes. But then, why would they be willing to mitigate the hostility of others, try to hide Meatly's real name, and make a fake screenshot that depicts Mike as a very open and amicable employer? In contrast, there were accounts like Cold Throwaway One, an account made in 2018 which seems to have only ever been used for the AMA, who almost exclusively went after Mike's responses and bashed Mike using a hostile tone and knowledge anyone could have heard of at that point from the Glassdoor reviews. If X Kindly Beast is on a smear campaign, then they could have been more effective, and I would have suspected them to use more of the same tactics in line with Cold Throwaway One if that were the case. 
but if it is an ex-employee anonymously asking questions and providing inside details, then everything lines up a lot more cleanly. While there's certainly room for skepticism, I believe they are who the name implies. As for Glassdoor, there are six Kindly Beast reviews as of recording and one that's been deleted. It was posted on the day of the firings, and apart from their claim of Mike being prone to mood swings, is basically corroborated by Mike's recounting of events in the AMA. It's possible that the review was deleted and later revised, as a similar review was posted later, which hits similar beats, and has the title of Senior Developer as opposed to Software Developer. Though these may also just be two individuals whose stories just so happen to align. Then there are the other reviews, four of which were posted on October 12th, a few days after the information on the firings began to spread, and were seemingly backed by those outside the situation who knew about Kindly Beast. Dirty Rectangles even went so far as to accuse Mike of being a Gamergate supporter. Jason Nunes said that Mike is, quote, comically inept, duplicitous, and dangerous, end quote. He went on to say that some people aren't saying anything because they're afraid of saying or doing anything that will set Mike and his lawyers off. Notice that this is almost the same excuse Matt used for the team not defending themselves. Don't get me wrong, both sides can be in legal trouble, but don't you think that if people had a positive experience with Kindly Beast, they would say... something? After all, it seems unlikely that Mike would go after people who said that they enjoyed their time at the company, and yet, nothing. Instead, ex-employees are liking tweets that agree with these claims, and even making references to the situation themselves. Unfortunately, both Dirty Rectangles and Jason deleted their tweets. While it could be possible that they decided they didn't want to get involved, Jason kept up a link to the Reddit post documenting the situation, and I find it more likely that Dirty Rectangles didn't want to accuse Kindly Beast of being a bunch of Gamergate supporters. If Jason is correct and Mike is threatening those speaking out, then this may also be another reason both were deleted. There is one other tweet that remains, and it comes from Vincent Livings, the creator of Dark Deception. I'll be honest, it isn't the strongest support, since sounds accurate isn't the same as is true, but he is the only one to address the Glassdoor reviews out of the three I've mentioned here. Initially, Dark Deception was going to have a crossover with Bendy. Instead, Vincent claims that they were treated as a low priority and had serious trouble working with Mike and Kindly Beast. While this certainly doesn't paint Mike out to look any better, this still doesn't support the reviews and their validity. However, Mike corroborates details in these reviews during his AMA. Get it done good enough, not being in the office, firing the VPs, poor management, and developing Showdown Bandit on his own with the Meatly. Given that these reviews describe events that hadn't been widespread at the time, and Mike confirms these specific details a couple of months after being posted, these are either excellent guessers or anonymous employees who are genuinely detailing their experiences at the studio. I suspect the latter, though there are some specific claims made that I am skeptical about, which I'll try and call out when we reach them. As for the reviews posted on October 15th and November 6th, they don't exactly do much apart from repeat things said in the prior reviews, so there's no need to debate their credibility when they're only saying things that have already been said in other reviews and confirmed outside of Glassdoor. So with that, let's start with the firings themselves. Unfortunately, this was not the first firing. On September 19th, the VPs, three of which were originally from Carmen Interactive, were fired. Mike claims that they were the ones who advised growing the company to the scale which it grew to. However, according to the Glassdoor reviews, the VPs were very capable and knowledgeable people who had the studio's best interests in mind, who were ignored, fired without cause, and had the policies they put into place dismantled. The reason they were fired was because, to the board of directors, they were useless. Quote, Management policies were rendered null, leaving a surplus of staff awaiting direction from the board. End quote. So then, why have the VPs to begin with? Well, because a board of an estimated three people can't all manage a business and 65 people all at the same time. However, they tried to do both and failed. Quote, Long periods of inactivity and no contact from the board were common. Any work being done during those times was almost guaranteed to be unused. End quote. Mike even admits to this being the case. Quote, the Meatly and I handed it off to a team and project lead without fully investing proper time and directing them in what this game was supposed to be. We received several messages from some team members saying that they didn't like it or they didn't understand it. Some were openly vocal in meetings about it, and we agreed. The Meatly and I tried our best to switch gears and guide the team in creating what was once prototype last year. We were ultimately not very successful and our leadership abilities were clearly lacking as we felt like everything we were asking for was not being heard. End quote. So while the firings may have made sense at the time, in the end it seems they should have kept them around, and the director should have made sure to have a vision and then communicate their vision to those managing parts of the project. So that's the first set of firings, and then there's the ones that everyone is well aware of. The October 11th firings. We know for a fact that Kindly Beast fired nearly 50 people, which on its own is a terrible thing. That's nearly 50 people working in a niche industry, now jobless before the holiday season. However, Mike claims that through poor financial management and high costs, that the firings had to happen or they would risk the company going bankrupt if they were to wait until after the holiday season. He also makes it a point to mention that this wasn't entirely his decision, but a unanimous decision of himself as well as their board of directors. So, who are the directors? 
Well, at least some of the directors are listed on a number of websites, some of which include a disturbing amount of information. These are likely names that people aren't familiar with, and that's because everyone on the board goes by an alias of one kind or another. Mike Mood is Mike DeJarnins and is the CEO, The Meatly is Paul Crawford and is CCO, and Bookpast is likely Stefan Crawford, given that Bookpast is credited as Chief Brand Officer in Shutdown Bandit, and so is Stefan on his LinkedIn page. For the sake of this, let's say that these are the only directors on the board, given that these are some of the highest positions of the company, they've all been around since Chapter 1 of Bendy, and nobody else is listed as a director from third-party sources. Anyways, Mike is the CEO and has a majority share in the company, at least according to him, so he is at least somewhat responsible for Kindly Beast and the decisions made. However, the Meatly and Book Pass both have never acknowledged the situation. In fact, both them and all Kindly Beast accounts have continued to post as if nothing happened. No public acknowledgement or apology. Some have cited the legal reasons Matt and Mike both mention, but given that Mike was able to do an AMA because he said that it was no longer an issue, the only way that this would still apply so heavily to both of them is if their legal issues are far more problematic and complicated compared to Mike's, thus warranting an extended period of silence. The only other reason I can think of for them not wanting to say anything is because, as an indie studio, their investors are the ones buying their games and merchandise, and if you make a controversy like this too publicly known, well... Imagine if the press caught sight of it! Mike's get off investors! So, oddly enough, Mike has actually done more to address this than any other Kindly Beast director. Even if it looked like he was shooting himself in the foot at times, it was certainly an effort. So, yes. The Kindly Beast team chose to fire 50 people and have barely publicly addressed it. And why would they? Admitting you've affected the lives of so many people certainly doesn't make you look like the good guy. But then, that's lying by omission. By not saying anything means that they're not being open about the truth. Sure, they don't exactly need to tell us these things, but then how can you trust a company when they aren't willing to tell you the truth? Especially given the gravity of some of these accusations, you should at least be giving your audience a choice of supporting you in the face of the situation, rather than hiding it from your audience and not allowing them to even choose. I wanted to believe that the Kindly Beast team were above trying to suddenly fire 50 people and never breathe a word about it to their audience. And I'm willing to bet that there's a large portion of their audience that would like to believe that too, but don't even know that this has happened because only Mike has said anything. Not the Meatly, not Bookpast, not their game social media, and not the studios. Mike did rope in the other Kindly Beast members and executives in his apology on Reddit, but that isn't exactly the same as an apology coming from them on their own platforms. Mike, as well as some of the defenders of Mike, had defended the firings by saying that mass firings happen all the time by tons of companies. To which my response is, yes, and? Just because a scummy thing is the standard, doesn't mean you should do something you know is scummy. Just because something is normal, that doesn't make it ethical. But then, why did this all happen? Employees were told that their jobs were safe days before the whole incident. Well, apparently nobody on the board knew the real hit they were taking with the failure of Showdown Bandit, because two days after Mike told everyone their jobs were safe, the CFO says that the company will go bankrupt if they don't do something and they couldn't afford to keep everyone on, so they chose to fire them and reduce the team to a more modest size. Though X Kindly B said that a VP told them that the company had a two-year runaway, Mike said that running the company was costing them nearly a million dollars a month and they would have potentially gone bankrupt if they hadn't immediately fired everyone. Some have pointed out the large warehouses of merchandise as a reason to believe that the company would not and will not go bankrupt anytime soon due to merchandise sales, and the idea that Showdown Bandit was, theoretically, a game with a $7 million investment backing it, it didn't sit well with those already unhappy with the game. Either way, nobody really knows what kind of loss Showdown Bandit was apart from the board, and so the truth behind the company's financial situation is anyone's guess. The question I have is how Mike believed that everything was fine financially two days before finding this out. He had to be aware of the huge financial losses to some extent, right? Mike even says that it was his job to approve the spending. Well, to be fair, he says that they mismanaged the finances and he takes full responsibility for it. And I really do applaud Mike for doing so here, even if his stories are a little confusing. Speaking of Showdown Bandit, one of the more conspiratorial theories has revolved around bigger name YouTubers, particularly Jacksepticeye. He had a voice role in Bendy, was given an early version of Chapter 5, and has now reprised his voice role in Boris and the Dark Survival. Jack, however, never played Showdown Bandit on his channel, which struck some viewers as odd since clearly Jack has some connections with Kindly Beast, and it's common for some developers to reach out to Let's Players in the hopes that they play their game and expose it to a larger audience. Some people believe that the game was too slow and shallow for a Let's Play to have been entertaining, while others believe that Kindly Beast may have specifically advised against playing the game, since Kindly Beast was aware that Showdown Bandit was not the company at their A game and were afraid of making a poor impression to their more casual audience, or simply wanted to decrease the wave of criticism they had received like with Bendy Chapter 5. Either way, without any proof to support this theory, the situation remains being viewed as many as simply suspicious. Though I certainly find it worth mentioning in this video. But now we have to ask a very important question. Did Kindly Beast break the law? 
As far as the holiday giveaway goes, no. Because those participating were still receiving a product, then it isn't technically gambling. Though many still believe that this giveaway rides the line between promoting gambling to children more than what should be comfortable for the company, and that Kindly Bee should have more control over their brand so that things like this simply do not happen. As for the firings, according to Ontario labor laws, as said by a non-Canadian, not a lawyer, if they fire over 50 employees within four weeks, then Kindly Beast would be required to provide an eight-week notice to their employees prior to the firings, but suddenly firing any number of employees under 50 is absolutely fine. While the initial number was barely under 50, Mike doesn't correct this during the AMA and uses that number himself. This might also be the legal trouble he and his company were in, considering that Matt said he couldn't talk about the situation. If they went over, then they've actually broken the law, though Mike could have just been including the VPs he fired as well in that statement. While I couldn't find a case for it, that could be the legal trouble that required the team to keep quiet about the situation for so long. However, without any proof that there was any sort of case, they could easily just be making up legal trouble as an excuse to not address the situation. After all, it's hard to blame them if it's out of their control, right? There's also the fact that Mike deleting his Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube is a bit of an overreaction. While it could have certainly reached that point for him, it seems suspicious that he wouldn't have just... logged off. After all, he doesn't even upload to his channel very frequently. While some believe that he may have been trying to purge any evidence for an investigation, I'm really just unsure of what to make of it. There are some who believe that the hate of the fanbase is to blame for Mike deleting his social media, though Mike corrects this during the AMA. Quote, You know, I've been on the internet since the early 90s. I've seen it all. I've got quite the thick skin. However, what I've never dealt with was people that I know, people I look up to, people who looked up to me, or people who I thought were friends or colleagues attacking and harassing me. I've dealt with death threats from random strangers over the course of 20 plus years online because that's the internet and all its terribly anonymous glory, but never from people I actually knew. So the day I deleted my social media accounts, I was in a very dark place and filled with far too many suicidal thoughts. I didn't want them to win, so I left." End quote. We'll discuss the individuals Mike is talking about later on, but it's clear that him leaving social media was at least somewhat due to those in his local community, and are likely those that Matt mentioned who he claimed would just twist whatever response Mike would give. Though some, myself included, still believe that deleting all content from every possible social media outlet was still very suspicious. Additionally, some of his detractors found Mike's statement discussing both his thick skin and coming back because of his fans as paradoxical and panderative, leaving the true nature of his social media purge largely up for debate. And then there's severance pay. Matt said that everyone had received proper severance, and Mike said that he gave everyone their severance in accordance with Ontario laws. How much would that be? Well, again, as a non-Canadian, not a lawyer, Kindly Beast would apparently have to meet certain criteria to even need to pay their employees. Their employees must work for them for five years or more, and Kindly Beast must have a payroll of at least $2.5 million, or fire 50 people within a six-month time span because at least part of their business is permanently closed. At most, these employees had worked for Kindly Beast for two years, hired back when it was still the Meatly Games. Kindly Beast fired nearly 50 people in just two months, but they didn't exactly close part of their business, and who really knows what their payroll is? The payroll is really the only possible qualifier, and even that is shaky at best given Mike's $1 million monthly estimate, and it's still missing the five years of employment. So technically, based on this, proper severance could be nothing. However, Mike says they fired everyone at the time in order to be able to give the employees severance and the option of a career assistance package. Though he later elaborates on this, saying that, quote, everyone receives severance under the laws of Ontario, Canada, end quote, and that he offered them extra if they signed a release agreement as well as a year-long assistance with Optimum Talent, a talent management firm. Given that Mike goes from writing several paragraphs to then only writing brief statements, has left some suspicious about why he wouldn't provide more details on the release agreement, a subject that, as you'll see, can be very complicated. So, what is a release agreement? Release agreements all have their own terms and conditions, but the primary use of them is that they remove an employee's right to sue their previous employer. Mike says that this is, quote, normal in employment law, and this is extremely standard in the workforce in any industry here in Ontario, Canada, end quote, and yet it's still suspicious that he would be willing to pay his employees more, if at all, if they sign an agreement commonly known for being used to remove the employee's right to sue the company. Again, it may be normal, but that doesn't make it ethical. But that's if this was just a release agreement, which is not typically how these things go. It's common that a non-disclosure agreement, an NDA, contains a release agreement, or vice versa, rather than there simply just being a release agreement. Being a small indie studio where your directors have a presence on social media, to then have people using the same platform to share their awful experience with the same audience wouldn't look good. So then, did the directors have employees sign an NDA? Well, it seems likely. 
Liz Wilson, former Kindly Beast concept artist, says that the reason ex-employees aren't saying anything is not due to privacy. Very few employees have even said anything, and you'd think that they would at least paint their experience as a pleasant one. I mean, you'd think that someone would say that their experience wasn't that bad at least, but instead there's just employees complimenting former co-workers, references to internal issues with the studio, and that the coffee machine was called Ariana Grande. Why not just explain the whole situation if privacy is not an issue? Well, an NDA would be a good reason to keep quiet. This is also where X-Kindly Beast comes into play once again. Well before Mike even mentions the release agreement, they reference Matt's response to me and say to Mike, quote, You offered us the legal minimum. You even fired people in a staggered fashion so we would not qualify for mass termination. You asked us to sign an NDA that has illegal, unforeseeable clauses for little to no incentive. You breached our contracts as well, but for an amount too small to be worth taking to a small claims court. End quote. Regardless if you believe X Kindly Beast or not, Mike admits to offering more money behind a release agreement which is commonly used as an NDA and removing an employee's rights to sue, and there's enough silence among ex-employees for this all to be more than a little suspicious. Let me be clear, if every employee took this offer, I don't blame them. Working in a niche industry and then being fired before the holidays, unsure of what their employment is going to look like, I would absolutely wave away my right to a lawsuit for a little more financial stability. It's also completely possible that at least some of the people had no big problem with Kindly Beast and signed the release agreement because they had no intention of suing anyway, but again, the silence points to the possibility of an NDA involved regardless of the experience of the employees, which on its own is suspicious. Then local developers in the Ottawa area have commented on Mike's behavior, specifically pointing out that Mike is the only one who is legally allowed to speak freely in regards to the allegations. Add that to the mild grumblings of employees and the detailed anonymous reviews, and it seems to only bolster the likelihood of it all. Mike can say that this is all normal in employment law, but I'd rather read the contract before just taking his word for it, which I hope those who were fired did as well. Another anonymous user in the AMA was named Kindly Beast 2 They only made four comments to the thread. Two were telling people to calm down, one was a response to a question about employees having to sign an NDA, which all I said in response was, yes, and finally one saying that emails were sent a week before the firings, saying that the company was backing out of a deal for a new office. They don't give too much to detect whether or not they're just trolls on a smear campaign, but the claims they make are at least worth noting. As for Optimum Talent, they clearly aren't very effective considering that Ryan Schmidt, former Quality Assurance Lead for Kindly Beast as well as writer, narrator, and editor of Gamepad Productions, was reaching out to help his former Kindly Beast co-workers find new jobs nearly a week before Christmas. So that's the Kindly Beast firings. Now let's have a look at the main point of contention with this controversy, the anonymous Glassdoor reviews. As I said, the events people talk about here mostly line up with Mike's retelling of the events months later, and so I see no reason not to believe the additional claims made, apart from being generally skeptical. So let's go over what everyone agrees on. Development of Showdown Bandit begins after the release of Bendy Chapter 5, and the team continues to grow over time. While there are people who are designated to manage the situation, they're unable to deliver the direction for their team in the way that the board would like. What's worse is that nobody really knew what Showdown Bandit was, including the board, meaning that all the staff can do is a process of trial and error to see what aligns with the board's vision. Months begin to pass, and as the release date they announce grows closer, the Melee and Mike then decide to make the game on their own based on the work already done by employees. Eventually, they are forced to delay it. At some point, likely after finishing and releasing Showdown Bandit, the management staff, including the VPs, are fired. Mike tells his employees several times that their jobs are safe, only to then have to turn around and fire them a few weeks after the VPs. There's also a mandate of get it done good enough, but we'll touch on that later. That's the stuff that both sides agree on. However, there are some more accusations thrown in alongside them. One that the majority of onlookers were skeptical about was this one. Quote, There was no apology, no explanation, no accountability, and no show. The firing was discovered by some when personal accounts became locked, followed by a publicly posted note to abide by our contractual obligations. So, is it true? Quote, due to legal reasons, I wasn't able to be available, nor were my decision-making colleagues. This was the advice of our legal counsel, as well as the professionals that came in to deliver the news and assist with employment assistance. End quote. While some people, myself included, would like to believe that the GamesIndustry.biz article is not the first time Mike, or any of the other directors for that matter, had reached out to those who were fired and apologized, there is very little to indicate otherwise. The most concerning details consistent in the Glassdoor reviews would have to be Mike's treatment towards employees as two of the reviews state that the CEO, aka Mike, would not only disregard work done by employees, but outright insult it. Two reviews say that he threatened employees, and one says Mike has no respect for them. While Mike doesn't believe that to be the case, he does still apologize if people felt that way. 
This situation is pretty messy. On one hand, you have Anonymous Reviews saying something that the CEO does not believe to be the situation, and willing to apologize for it anyways and say that they're going to improve. On the other, given that the events in these reviews line up with what Mike says, and that there's a possible NDA that ex-employees are under, then the fact that there are several of these reviews saying that Mike was cultivating a toxic environment, and with those in the community agreeing with this, then this should be seen as concerning, especially when Mike says he's done nothing wrong, so how and why would he improve something that he believes is already fine? He claims that people would call him out if this happened, but why would they? He owns 50% of the company. Especially if this was during private meetings, then there'd be no one to stop him apart from maybe the people Mike is friends and business partners with, who also have less of a share in the company than him. I know that Mike and even that Slack screenshot paint him as a very open person, but stress can negate all goodwill in a person, and running a company that just failed to launch a product and has also been hit with a massive financial loss because of it, I can see how that would be a stressful and overwhelming situation, and one that could have unintended consequences when not coping with it very well. The alternative here is that Mike is just like this and is simply trying to keep up appearances among employees and his audience, and given that Pascal dismissed the need for fans to know what happened, and then lied about ex-employees being hateful in the thread, some believe that Pascal and Matt are simply on Mike's good side and are complicit in Kindly Bee's attempt to keep the situation hushed up and minimalized. While I am definitely skeptical about the idea that Mike has in some way manipulated Matt and Pascal, I don't find this accusation to be without its merits. They may not be sock puppets for Mike to control, but the lengths that they've gone to in order to defend Mike leaves this accusation with some merit in my opinion. I also want to say that while Matt and Pascal may have had good experiences with Mike and the company, that does not make it the case for everyone. The experiences of everyone are unique, as people are treated differently by everyone around them. Now, both the allegations of a toxic work environment and outright abuse in the workplace are serious allegations, and I want to remind you that there has barely been any sort of response from the Kindly Beast team with the exception of the Reddit AMA and what Matt said to me on Twitter. If I were Mike and I never abused or harassed anyone, I wouldn't just be using anecdotal evidence but providing anything I have to help distance myself from these allegations, like the screenshot that X Kenley Beast showed which paints him as a very open and easygoing boss. Instead, Mike believes that he has done nothing wrong, and yet only uses his word in the word of Matt to back it. I would also like to note the particular wording Mike is using. I. Don't. Believe. Given that Mike says this after getting out of legal issues, I find it possible that he's been advised to choose his words carefully, hence why he isn't outright denying the claims even if they are untrue. Regardless of the toxic environment and harassment being true or false, I don't think that the legal issues excuse the lack of contradicting information which he, as the CEO, could likely provide if he wanted to ensure that there were as few grey areas in this as possible. So a response like that can either mean that Mike didn't do anything wrong, and these are untrue allegations that he simply isn't disputing with evidence that he likely has and would be able to provide if he wanted to, or it means that Mike could have been abusive in the workplace and pleads ignorance. The fact that these are the circumstances surrounding the allegations, I find to be just very concerning. However, I'd also like to point out now that there are systems in place to prevent things like workplace abuse from happening, such as human resources. Just so that we're all on the same page, human resources is meant to be a medium for employees to speak to someone that the higher-ups will listen to. Kindly Beast has an HR department, so then did they do anything, and if not, why? Well, let's talk about nepotism. Nepotism is basically when one person has their friends or family benefit from their power, money, or whatever they have. This includes being the CEO and hiring your family as part of the company. Cinda Jarnins is Mike's sister and was hired as office manager. Now before I go on, just because nepotism may or may not be what got Sin hired, it doesn't make her a bad employee. However, the problem comes when she became not only the head of HR, but the only HR employee at Kindly Beast. Imagine your boss had an outburst, threatens you, and the only person you can come to about it is the person that he not only hired, but is also related to him. That is just a clear conflict of interest, and a situation that would leave many people to just not feel comfortable talking about an event like that with someone like her. She's also been vocal about the firings on social media, which some have pointed to as showcasing her clear bias in these potential cases. On Twitter, she laughed at people wanting an apology from Kindly Beast, calling it unprofessional. To be clear, this woman is laughing at the idea that people who were suddenly fired before the holiday season want an apology from a company whose business has thrived off of public social media like YouTube and Twitter. She deleted her tweet later on, likely after people in the AMA began to share links to it. She echoed similar statements on Instagram, as two days after the firings, she acts as if the outrage is just purely toxic hate. Unfortunately, Kindly Beast was completely silent, and so all we knew at the time were that 50 people's livelihoods were suddenly uprooted, and that her brother may have been abusive in the workplace. 
She then cites an article called Six Reasons Why People Lie When They Don't Need To, implying that the accusations are untrue without denying any of the numerous allegations specifically or providing any contradictory evidence. Finally, she made this moment on Instagram where she talks about misinformation. She encourages people to not believe everything they read unless they're sure of the source, something she learned in law school. Without providing an alternative version of events, providing any proof, and then just calling the outrage blind toxic hate, many in the community have viewed Sin as someone who acts morally righteous without backing any claims. Frankly, I'm inclined to agree. But Sin is not the only family member involved with this controversy, because it would seem that Mike's own mother made a throwaway account in order to defend him during the Reda AMA. Sin mentions that a family member was mistaken for Cricket, the Kindly Beast PR manager, but the user themselves confirms their relationship to Mike, apart from saying that Mike has multiple sisters, and said, quote, My kid was crying at the hate and I created an account to have a look. End quote. Unfortunately, she both calls people petty and acts as if nothing bothers her, only to then dish out petty insults herself and then claim that she's being harassed while continuing to instigate the situation. Much like Sin, she's supporting Mike without having anything to really say in order to back it against these overwhelming allegations, and instead resorts to denial and petty insults. So that's Mike's side of the nepotism coin, but then what about the Meatly and Book past? Well, Paul and Stefan share a last name, so I have to imagine it's more than just a coincidence. There's certainly potential for there to be something going on, but there's nothing apparent. However, I would now like to switch gears and discuss one of the more bizarre and common allegations in this whole controversy, regarding Mike and the Kindly Beast PR manager. Cricket, aka Foxygen, has been viewed as a problematic figure in this controversy, due to her role as a PR manager for Kindly Beast and what some deem to be her dramatic tendencies. As said before, Bendy has mostly been a hit in no small part due to YouTube and Twitter. All three directors have a Twitter account and YouTube channel, you can find a showdown bandit Twitter and Instagram account, and both Bendy and Kindly Beast have all three. Mike claims that he doesn't have a PR manager during the Reddit AMA, which is technically true, but the company he is the CEO of hired a woman who has PR manager in her bio and was asked to redirect people who have asked questions already answered by Mike in the Reddit AMA. A few days after the firings, a Reddit moderator was banned from the Showdown Bandit Discord server for discussing the situation. When someone mentioned this, she said it was not up for discussion. Then she began asking who the users are in a screenshot of Care, an artist I happen to follow, and Kyle Allen Music talking about Mike making fun of Scott, presumably Scott Cawthon, the creator of Five Nights at Freddy's. Some believe that Cricket was wanting to confront Care, though her intentions are never made clear. Care said that she had had a bad experience with Kindly Beast and was now being witch hunted by Cricket for both the screenshot and for trolling. Then during the Reddit AMA, she redirects people asking questions that have already been answered and defends her actions while still saying that the individuals in the thread are trolling. She had insults such as Hose Mad and OK Boomer thrown her way, as well as being called a bootlicker and being accused of having a relationship with Mike, with people calling Mike... Ink Daddy. So, let's clarify the situation a bit. While the Meatly and Book Pass both have some sort of pseudonym backing their alias, I want to explain Mike's, because at one point Mike Mood was his real name, and yet under all the documents I could find on Mike, it says his last name is Desjardins. While Desjardins is his original last name, Mike married Jillian Mood back in 2017. They even created the Mood Foundation and had a media division called Gamepad Productions. Unfortunately, neither accounts have been active since 2018. Then a friend of care photoshops this and sends it in a reply to Mike. Quote, I cheated on my wife with several women who only liked me for my money. End quote. Mike, with his new attitude in hand, responded, quote, My wife? I left my wife on June 28th, 2017 and met someone six months ago. Haha, <laughs> that's hilarious though. Anyone who knows me knows this is laughable. End quote. The problem with that is that Jillian's Twitter has her calling Mike her husband in March of 2018 and continues until June of 2018. After that, no Mike and no Bendy from Jillian. This was probably just a typo on Mike's part, but it's clear to see that these two split up at some point, and when Jillian left, she may have taken the name of Mood with her. What happened between these two is unclear, and I've yet to find any evidence to prove that Mike Mood cheated on Jillian with anybody. It's at least not been made public at any point, thus I find it to be just a random insult and a baseless accusation. Cricket later went on to Twitter to vent her frustrations with those who chose to belittle her during the Reddit AMA. Pascal would seem to imply that these individuals were ex-employees, though the ones in the thread are clearly not ex-employees, nor do they claim to be. Detractors have deemed this blatant lying as an attempt to discredit ex-employees as angry individuals rather than credible victims to the poor management and potential workplace abuse. But with that said, let's get back to Cricket. As PR manager, your primary goal is to get people talking about your company and its products in a positive light. 
However, as in this case, you have to be prepared for negative PR. And with a fanbase like Benny's that has built in a range of both children and adults, then everything from petty insults to outright lies can come your way. Cricket is a human being, and one that has to take part in one of the worst parts of her job. Should Cricket be harassed and insulted, being accused of things without any basis in reality? No, obviously. Do I think she should act like nothing bothers her while also playing the victim? No, that's ridiculous. Really, there's not much else to say here. How she handles how people react to the poor decisions made by her superiors is not what I'm worried about in this video, and while I find it worth mentioning, I don't find it worth fully scrutinizing. Her intentions here may be cloudy at best, and she may have made at least one poor decision, but her mistakes are far from those who she works for, and she seems to keep a level head most of the time, both in this thread and in Discord. Now, those are my exact words I had written back in March. However, in May, Cricket was fired without notice. She was fired from her job during a global pandemic without warning. Regardless of her conduct, she didn't deserve this. None of the directors publicly apologized or wished her farewell and good luck, which at this point is more predictable of them than it is telling. So with that out of the way, let's finally discuss the hate that Mike Mood experienced. When talking about the hate in the Reddit AMA, Mike says that he came back because, quote, I realize that my fans aren't a small group of nobodies gathering once a month to pat each other on the back for their accomplishments of being bullies while they stand behind an anti-harassment code of conduct. Instead, I realize my fans were amazing, caring, supportive, creative, and extremely passionate people who deserve better. So I'm here to not let the hate win and tell my fans I hear you and I care about you." End quote. This would seem to imply that local individuals in his community would be to blame for his purging of social media and suicidal thoughts more so than his online following. Dirk Ludo, aka Sugarbeard, is co-founder of Dirty Rectangles and a developer in the Ottawa area who has known about Mike since 2014, all the way back when Mike still used the Twitter handle of Zero Logics. Derek quoted Mike's words, saying, The clown called us a small group of nobodies and bullies for kicking him out. I call it the code of conduct at work. Slow clap, keep dunking on yourself. End quote. So, what is the code of conduct? Well, on Dirty Rectangle's website, they have an anti-harassment policy as well as a list of examples. In order to have been kicked out, Mike likely did something which adheres to the following. Verbal comments that reinforce social structures of domination related to gender, gender identity and expression, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, age, or religion, sexual images in public spaces, deliberate intimidation, stalking or following, harassment photography or recording, sustained disruption of talks or other events, inappropriate physical contact, unwelcome sexual attention, advocating for or encouraging any of the above behavior. Of course, which one Mike was kicked out for is unclear, though Mike never claims to have been kicked out unfairly or for no reason. Derek was also not the only local developer to comment on Mike's Reddit AMA. Tony, I am going to mispronounce this name, Kukluzi, former lead developer of Cuphead, made a thread discussing Mike's behavior directly. He claims that Mike is throwing shade at the game dev community directly before discussing Mike's behavior. Quote, Mike, we used to be friends back when you were a nobody. Since then, I've watched you grow into a selfish, egotistical, lawyer-wielding corporate shill and a Gamergate-supporting nightmare of a human being. End quote. Mike said in the Reddit AMA that he doesn't support Gamergate, though his response to this thread has been deleted and was not documented. It's also important to note that Mike was asked about representation of both people of color and the LGBTQ community, and said that their characters are defined by what they do, not by what they identify as. A response which is almost comical when Chapter 3 of Bendy is about a woman who was charmed and manipulated by a man who broke her heart. But hey, it's only a game inspired by the 1930s which has a demonic entity made of ink in it, so I guess they draw the line of realism when it comes to minorities? Are characters just that much harder to write in when they're gay? But anyways, back to the topic at hand, sometime later Dirty Rectangles included in their bio, quote, a small group of nobodies. It's also important to note that Daniel Bennett, former 3D animator, and Mark Pinter like parts of this thread, and Risky Pixels, aka a name I'm not even going to try to pronounce, former Kindly Beast 3D animator, has the Dirty Rectangles logo on his shirt in his Twitter profile picture. Needless to say, it seems ex-employees don't share the same opinion as Mike when it comes to Dirty Rectangles. And finally, we've come to the end of the Reddit AMA. Many people have asked if, and why, the Reddit AMA was a failure, and while some have said it was due to Mike's ambiguous responses and the hateful nature of those in the thread, others believe it was destined to not change anything due to the thread being so contained to such a small portion of the fanbase, as information being public on any of the company's social media pages would have likely been more effective. Mike J, former level designer at Kindly Beast, 
also said that the AMA, quote, ended up being a bunch of blame shifting, arrogance, and lies, end quote. But Mike Mood wasn't done here. His Twitter account, with his new attitude by his side, began to reply to some of his detractors. First, I want to point out that Mike gave a very good apology and well wishes to ex-employees. I really want to make it clear that when Mike makes an effort in responding, he can stick the landing. But he can also miss the mark. When someone mentioned the detailed reviews that line up with what little information Mike was willing to give, his only defense was that he is an anonymous. Again, silent employees, release agreement, NDA. Given that it seems Mike is part of the reason people are not speaking publicly, then this is like claiming you won a game of chess even though you only let your opponent have their king. Some have taken this as part of the plan from the beginning, to discredit any allegations by forcing ex-employees to hide under anonymous accounts. Additionally, there are allegations from named individuals such as Tony, who cannot be easily discredited given their reputation. Then Mike claims he has no salary and makes no money off of anything. Mike's financial situation isn't well known. He went into a little detail in the AMA, and here's where I'll say that I really do believe that he's not rich, though how much money he's making isn't easy to figure out either. However, some have compared this to him having no PR manager, as he owns 50% of the company, which likely includes any value in revenue. Mike is anti-union and said that the situation for his company and its employees would have been the same regardless, which didn't sit well with people. He complained about people hating on him and how they've never ran a company of 50 people before. Mike was part of the decision to hire 50 people, and he failed to use them effectively. You don't need to have been in the same position as Mike to understand that in the end, he has made mistakes. He can learn from them, but they are mistakes regardless. Mike said that what happened was two months ago, and what's done is done. Unfortunately, there are people who still don't have any idea that this happened, and it feels like Mike doesn't want to make it public and risk losing fans. I understand not wanting misinformation to ruin your brand, but hiding information is just as shady, and can cause a Streisand effect. Mike asked someone to photoshop him on top of an image of a dumpster fire, which... okay. Then, it comes out that they've gotten rid of Ariana Grande. Mike said that the hate online no longer affects his mental state, a statement largely seen as untrue when he deleted his tweets again around New Year's. Then, sometime in June, the purge began. Suddenly, Showdown Bandit was no longer available on Steam or Game Jolt, and it was apparently removed at the request of the publisher. Showdown Bandit's Twitter and Instagram were now blank slates, as was the website, uh, apart from the store page. The same thing had happened with Kindly Beast. The entire company had just... disappeared. It would seem to be that Kindly Beast had officially been considered a failed venture, and the team is now exclusively working under Joey Drew Studios and making Bendy products from here on out. There was no statement, but everything seems to have quietly vanished overnight. Even the Meatly's video announcing the launch of Kindly Beast was just... gone. Mike also changed his Twitter handle to at underscore Mike Mood, and since nobody had set up a placeholder account to redirect it, I decided to snag it and begin reposting some of Mike's deleted content. Some people have even tagged Kindly Mike Mood and the real Mike Mood in the same tweet, which has just made my heart smile. So it would seem that Kindly Beast no longer exists, but Joey Drew Studios is still going. But make no mistake, it's the same people from the same company under a different name. These problems don't disappear by blacking out your Twitter profile pic. It starts with an apology. Now, before moving on to the treatment of their games, I want to give my thoughts on the situation regarding the Kindly Beast team, as this is nearly the whole case for the Kindly Beast firings. In the end, the truth is limited, as are people's willingness to tell it. Mike, the Meatly, and Bookpass have all made some poor choices that have led them here. Some are willing to admit these mistakes, but for so many people to want this information to be public, they're quick to delete things and rarely cite contradicting sources. All three directors are responsible for the mismanagement, the firings, and for the release agreement's potential issues. Mike is responsible for the poor apology in response to the backlash, but has at least made an effort to respond and has been able to do so gracefully at times. He had his sister be their HR department, which, even with her social media posts aside, is a clear conflict of interest, and tried to make the layoffs seem like okay things because they're common, even though it's a scummy thing to do. The Meatly and Book Past have refused to breathe a word on the situation, which is likely due to PR reasons. If they boost this information using their platforms, then it could ruin sales for them and cut off a substantial part of their fan base. I mean, you can't be known as monsters if the information doesn't spread, right? If that's why they've not said anything, then I'd say they're just as bad as Mike in this instance, if not worse. Ultimately, I'm incredibly disappointed by Kindly Beast. 
Even with just the concrete information, their actions do not reflect a company I want to support, and definitely not the company I thought I was supporting. It's disappointing. But I can confidently say that I no longer regret liking that tweet which had Sin block me. Because now that I've waded through this situation, I stand by it. But hey, maybe I'm just biased. Okay, follows don't equal endorsements, but come on, his ex-wife follows me. That's a little funny. Okay, so they're not great people. I'm not saying they can't learn, but learning starts with admitting your mistakes. If you want to forgive someone, they need to apologize first. Mike has at least apologized, but the Million Book Past have yet to even reach that step. The controversy may be over, but they're a long way from fixing their mistakes. But then, what about the games? Clearly, I like Bendy, and it's got a sequel coming. Would I give them money despite the situation? Well, no. Because even if this whole situation was a big misunderstanding, and the Kindly Beast team made all the right choices when it comes to PR, their employees, and their company, they have seriously neglected their games and have been willing to lie to customers in order to try and increase their sales and decrease backlash. This all starts a little before Bendy Chapter 5's release. Mike was on a podcast discussing Bendy's development when he said they only knew the ending of the game and based Chapter 3 around what fans wanted, which was Alice Angel. You know, it was, it was a complete accident. Um, you know, we, we'd like to say we knew exactly what was going to happen, but, but really, at the end of the day, we knew the beginning and we knew the end of the game. Everything that happened in between was was kind of developed as we went along. Things kind of progressed and changed. Like a, an example would be in Chapter 2, we had a poster of Alice Angel, and that was just one poster off in the corner, whatever, and the fans just started doing fan art, they, they just fell in love with the character, and there really there was nothing explaining what this character was. Yeah. And at the time, we were getting ready to jump into Chapter 3, and it made it really obvious that Chapter 3 should be about Alice Angel, right? So, Given that the lore and analysis of the game has been heavily discussed among fans, finding out that the game's story wasn't intentionally detailed and planned out was a frustrating discovery. It would also seem to contradict what Mike said during an interview back in 2017. When the game became popular and people liked it, um, like, the Meatly and I had to sit down and be like, okay, what, what's the story, right? Like, what is the whole point? And so we had the story, and we continue to build on the story. People were also upset when Mike said, quote, Not much research goes into these characters. We just kind of make them and moved on. End quote. This also particularly upset fans who had spent the last two years theorizing about a game that, as it turns out, was never actually made to be theorized on, even though the creators advertised it as if it was. But that's not all. Mike admits to using ideas from fan theories for the lore of Bendy, and calls it one of the perks of making an episodic game. But the only people credited in the game as writers are the Meatly and Book Past. So the creators of Bendy saw at least one fan theory, and wrote it into their game as canon without permission or credit. If you're using someone else's ideas, then you need to at least credit them as a writer. Not only were Mike and Meatly unsure of what to do with their own game, and pretending as if they had it all figured out since Chapter 3, but now they've been revealed to have been stealing ideas from their fan base without credit. Then came Chapter 5, Bugs Galore. After nearly two years, it's not been updated once on Steam, even though the game has bugs that seriously affect gameplay, if not make the game unplayable at times with things like infinite loading when loading save files, and AI softlocking parts of Chapter 5. Back in April of 2019, Mike said that the team was too busy focusing on too many projects to go back to it. When you can't make sure your flagship game is playable by the end, how is anyone supposed to trust your future products? But then Mike was asked again in the AMA about the bugs. Now it wasn't a matter of being too busy, but now they don't have the time or the money. They hope to update it when Bendy 2 is released, and that's probably the soonest possibility. Mike does apologize if fans have felt ignored on this as well. Time and money. But then Mike claims several times that he and the team aren't in it for the money, that they're willing to go broke just to make games for their fans. This was again contradicted by Mike when he said Bendy no longer makes enough money to justify fixing it. Their flagship title, which has sold at least 300,000 copies and has a ton of merchandise, is somehow not worth fixing, but they're not in it for the money. Setting aside the fact that Kindly Beast had merchandise made before Bendy 2 was finished, 
hence why people were able to buy Dark Revival merchandise on the website in October of 2019, and even now, then why not fix your game before moving on to something else? I understand wanting to work on something new, but that new thing they're working on is now a sequel to a broken game. Also, saying that the game doesn't make enough money to justify fixing it, not exactly true. On top of that, Mike now knows how to make proper save files. It may not exactly be a matter of copy and paste, but it should be worth making your product fully functional for the hundreds of thousands of people who bought it. Then there's Showdown Bandit. Their statement they posted announcing the delay would seem to imply that the game needed polishing. But now thanks to Mike, we now know that the game was actually being built in that time. While they claim that this delay was to make the game, quote, the best it can be when it reaches our players and fans, end quote, Mike admits to it being, quote, a game that wasn't worthy of our audience, end quote. It also didn't help that they decided to cut out the fact that this was only episode one of Showdown Bandit in the promotional material in the other release, and removed any mention of it from YouTube and Steam. To not include that detail is one thing, but to deliberately cut it out of the trailer means they were fully aware of what they were doing. That, or they cut it out because the release date had now changed, and really didn't think about labeling it as episode one, which is a bit too coincidental for me to believe. And now we finally come to one of the worst things said in any of the Glassdoor reviews, which were claims that Kindly Beasts don't care about the quality of their products. Instead, they had a phrase along the lines of, get it done, good enough. Several reviews talk about how productivity was above quality, including things like, quote, good enough, our fans won't care, and as long as the game appears to work for the player, ship it, end quote. Other reviews talk about how projects were to be completed in under a day, and, quote, attempts to innovate were seen as a problem. End quote. What did Mike have to say about this? Well, that that's basically true. Before going forward, I want to make it clear that Mike doesn't apologize. He defends this mentality and method of making games. This means they are likely still making their games with this same mentality. Mike uses a shirt making analogy and describes two ways of making shirts. If the client wants the order early, then only one method will have a semblance of an actual shirt. The problem with this analogy is that, in this instance, the shirt makers are setting a due date for themselves based off of when they think the shipment will be done. The directors have set up when merchandise would release so it would come out alongside the game, and they had miscalculated their own release date. Kindly Beast has chosen to run their company this way, and as an independent studio, there's nobody stopping them from just not even discussing merchandise until after the game is out. Nothing, apart from maybe the fact that we've got to have. Money. Then in February, he poked fun at the Glassdoor reviews during the release of Boris and the Dark Survival, since that game had only taken a few weeks to make. Given that this accusation of the mandate was proven to be true, and Mike is now poking fun at it, this was regarded as, uh, let me check my notes, bit of a dick move. Sin also tweeted out something similar. If your company rushes out games, you shouldn't brag about that. If this information was made public by a negative employee review, then you shouldn't act all sly by referencing a review which paints a negative picture of your company, which you also corroborated. Otherwise, you kind of look like an idiot. So no, they are not in any way guaranteeing that they will make a quality or playable product, and they are willing to lie in order to convince people otherwise. Throughout all of this, Mike says that their plan is not to innovate through how they make their games, but through, quote, our stories, our characters, and our brands, end quote. Their story of Bendy is constantly in flux, which Mike admits to in the AMA, their characters don't have a lot of thought put into them, and their brand is now associated with this whole ordeal. There's no innovation, but instead what would seem to be a bunch of excuses. However, they do have a Bible when it comes to character merchandise, but hey, they're not in it for the money, right? So, with that said, let's wrap everything up. So, to recap, Kindly Beast fired 50 people, offered them more money if they would sign a release agreement, which are contracts usually used to waive an ex-employee's right to sue, as well as act as an NDA. Kindly Beast also fired their PR manager during a global pandemic without notice. They lied about the reason for the delay of Showdown Bandit, mismarketed the release of the game, and have yet to fix their flagship title. They also developed their games by seeing if it works for the player rather than QA testing, which they had a team for when developing Showdown Bandit, who they decided to skip in order to release the game sooner. The Meatly and Book Pass have never said anything about the situation, and neither have their business's social media accounts, 
leaving most of their audience clueless about this whole situation. Mike deleted his social media, and after coming back, he deleted his tweets again for some unknown reason. Mike allowed Sin, his sister, to be the head of HR as well as their only HR employee, which is a clear conflict of interest, and Mike has been accused of verbal abuse. Mike has given a sincere apology for the October 11th firings, but has also not apologized for anything else, and has also made rude remarks about the situation, as well as his family who have done nothing to reject the accusations without any counterpoints or evidence, and have instead thrown petty insults. Mike has also admitted that they don't put a lot of thought into their characters, and have not written Bendy with deep lore in mind, but also claims that they innovate through their characters and stories. However, they also stole parts of their story of Bendy from their fanbase and have never given any credit. Some people I've seen really want this company to just... burn. I don't consider myself in this camp, but even if I did, I know that this company will survive. Even if the sales were terrible, Shodan Bandit has positive reviews, which just proves how loyal the Kindly Beast core fanbase is, and Mike points this out in the AMA as a point of pride. And when Bendy 2 comes out, people who don't know anything about the situation will buy and support people with this kind of history, whether they know it or not. There are even some people who think that because the drama is irrelevant, that people should stop talking about it and support Kindly Beast anyways. But I've made this video to compile and document exactly what happened, so that I now know and can say whether or not I will continue to support this company. While I understand separating art from its artist, these artists still benefit from myself and everyone else supporting the art that they sell, and it would seem to be a choice that they don't want their audience to make, hence why they don't present the information to their audience themselves and allow them to choose. So then, what do I believe they should do to fix things? Well, for starters, they need to be transparent. They should try to come forward with details on the release agreement particularly, but they should at least make a public statement on their social media pages confirming or denying everything I've mentioned here, so that everyone knows what they've done and everyone can collectively move on. If there is an NDA, then they should try to release ex-employees from it so that everyone can come forward at once and give their version of events so that there's no speculation needed. They should also allow their community to talk about it on Discord, Reddit, and wherever else. Holding back this information from people helps no one, and censorship definitely isn't helpful. Then, I'd work on fixing Bendy. The Steam version needs fixing, but Kindly Beast also needs to try and do what they can in order to get control over their console port from Rooster Teeth. Otherwise, their flagship game is going to remain a warning to those outside the core Bendy fanbase as to what kind of quality these developers are comfortable with. If they have to wait until the contract expires, then they should still fix it when the game is back in their hands. Because it should be worth fixing your game for the hundreds of thousands of people who bought it. That's also the next thing I'd fix. Develop the games with quality in mind, and then make the merchandise after the game is out. An indie studio shouldn't be competing with their own deadlines, especially if they're wanting to please the less dedicated members of their fanbase, and this mandate which dismisses quality is only going to further alienate the player base. Finally, I think they should hire people to keep them in check if they ever try to expand again, and Sin should at least not be the only HR employee, or part of HR at all. That position holds too clear of an issue given her family relations and her past remarks. Do I think they'll do any of this? No, but even if there's a chance they'd see this, then I'd like to give some sort of constructive criticism, advice, or whatever you want to call it. So now I want to come back to that original question that started this whole video. Should I support Kindly Beast? Because by buying their games and merchandise, it benefits them and goes to support the way they've treated their games and the people who help to make them what they are. They clearly do care about money in order to do what they've done, and the studio wouldn't exist today if fans like myself and others hadn't paid to buy the game and support them. It may not mean much considering their hardcore player base, but it meant enough to me to find out as much as I could, weigh out the circumstances, and come to a conclusion. So, in conclusion, Kindly Beast is a company that, in its current state, I will not support. They have made mistakes and deliberately poor choices to get to where they are now affecting people's lives, lying to their player base, stealing from their fan base without credit, and not even ensuring that they are delivering a playable product. That's not even mentioning their silence towards more concerning allegations, which they have not denied regardless of the time that has passed or the concern from their fan base. They can change, and I hope that they do. But for now, I will follow Kindly Beast in the hopes that they improve, or in case anything else happens. But I will not endorse or support their products. I really can't say how disappointed I am that the people who I looked up to turned out to be the monsters they didn't want to be known as. But then I have to ask myself again, do I finish the story of Bendy? After all, it's a broken game made by a company full of poor choices. Well, I don't think I will. Or at least, I won't be investing the same energy and production quality as I had in the past. I've spent a lot of time and energy following this company and making this video, 
to where I no longer feel like investing any more energy into them if they remain as they are now. As for everyone else, you're free to make your own decisions based on the information I've given here. I know that some people who have been following this seem to have just brushed past it and continue to support Kindly Beast, and I'm sure some creators have done so because of Bendy's influence. But I encourage you to make the situation known, because even if you want to keep supporting Kindly Beast, I think you can agree that everyone should be able to make an educated choice on whether or not they should continue to. So please, share the story with those out of the loop. Maybe even Kindly Beast staff so that they know what's known about the situation and can maybe course correct to help rebuild trust between them and their community. Like I said, I think they can change, but that's going to take some work, and maybe some encouragement. This video is not monetized, and this isn't the content I usually make, so I have very little to gain from this situation and this video. So, with that being said, thank you for watching.